this fits for that tech. In our third film, we dove into a vision for light field displays. Um, we imagined that there's a larger light field display, maybe 10 feet in front of that table, that is working with the table to uh, project that media out in front of the students so they can experience it that way. And we imagined this would be a compelling use case for education. In this final sequence that you saw in the film there, um, we are imagining a partial holodeck solution where we've got the back wall of, of the office and then the floor that are working together to create that volumetric image of the bike. In this particular example, the two people on the left are photorealistic avatars that are dialing in from a separate location. So the two people on the right are actually there presently on the stage. So the system has to orchestrate all three locations plus the shared media and the spatial orientation needs to work together. So this was, uh, you know, we imagine the future of Zoom meetings with plus spatial orientation that the system is dealing with. So all this volumetric content, all, the, all these use cases are great. This technology is great. But as a storyteller, why do I really need volume? How does this really change the game? What is the must-have experience that's going to scale and that commercial networks are going to need to deliver? I want to be clear that each stage in this evolutionary chart uh, doesn't mean that the next stage is any better than the one before it. All this chart is showing is that a new experience has been made possible by the evolution of technology. And there's a, uh, an analogy that I like to use to help explain what's going on here experientially. So imagine, I want everybody just to imagine for a second, a little boy looking at an ant hill. If he's just sitting there looking at the ants, this is a passive experience, like watching a movie. It's also an observational experience. Now imagine that kid grabs a stick and he starts poking and prodding at the ants. This is like an interactive experience as if he's using a joystick or a controller of some kind, but it's still observational. He is observing the ants while he's interacting with, with them. Now imagine taking that boy and putting him into a playground with that stick to poke and prod at the playground. That doesn't work. The kid wants to get rid of the stick and just go play. So before I had terminology for this slide, I was talking to a friend of mine about it, and I was really trying to dig in because I really wanted to get this right. And I said, I was asking him, I said, what is experientially the difference between poking and prodding at the ants and being in the playground? And his 13-year-old son was there and he chimed in and said, I'd say we're going from controlling to being. And we looked at each other like, well, I mean, that's, that kind of nails it, right? And it was kind of brilliant. Uh, so I wish I could take credit for this, but it was actually a 13-year-old who saw it. Volumetric technology is moving the audience away from the experience of observing and, move, and moving towards the experience of being with the content. And that is a profound change. This is like a holiday. And if somebody, a person is going to be in a state of being, and if that's going to be part of the narrative, Nonverbal behavior needs to be handled by the system. Now, this includes intentional actions like pointing at something. This is intentional. But it also includes unconscious actions of body language and spatial orientation. So imagine if this couple comes walking down the path just a little bit further, 
they stop and they look around, and the guy kind of crosses his arms and, and leans back and kind of gives a funny expression. How does the system know what that means and how does it respond? This all has to do with the context of the experience. Saliency is a term from robotics. It has to do with how the computer system is making sense of the world out there, the human world. So in this example, if an autonomous car is driving down the road and it sees a deer, there's a whole series of things that happen. First of all, the computer vision sees that it's a real deer and not a sign of a deer. And the system knows that a large animal in the middle of the road is dangerous for the driver. So now a whole series of protocols kick in. Well, maybe the car slows down. And then if nothing happens with the deer, then maybe the car pulls off to the side and stops and waits for the deer to move on. If the car sees the deer and responds appropriately, this is saliency in the context of passenger safety. Volumetric narratives need to do the same thing. In this example, Yoda is the car and the kid is the deer. The display is looking out at the kid and Yoda will do something in response to however the kid acts or doesn't act. The context of the experience is a creative choice. It could be anything. If we're dealing with a, uh, an archetype, you know, a master warrior archetype with Yoda, and we're dealing with the demographic of the kid, maybe, maybe the context is overcoming fear. It could be anything. But whatever it is, it's going to frame up what this experience means for this kid going into it. Now, AI experts are going to jump in at this point, and they're going to say, wait a minute. <laughs> in order for this to work, Yoda needs two-way natural language capability <coughs> and spatial awareness and responses to the user, both of which really are not well-developed or understood yet. And for the user, without getting into natural language limitations, uh, the system needs to understand his unique emotive journey through the system and his spatial reactions to Yoda as well. So yeah, this technology is not there yet, but this is the direction that it's evolving. If the user is in a state of being, in the context of the experiences, overcoming fear, what does it mean to experience a character arc? And how can that arc be made to be authentic for each user when everybody's different? Screenwriters work with conscious and unconscious desires when they develop their characters. Will there be a system in the future that can handle a human's unconscious desire. This is where I think the magic of volumetric systems is at. <laughs> We've got a long ways to go before we start answering any of these questions. We're at the infancy. I imagine a, a future production technique might be to hire a million people to go train user journeys through a complex narrative system. Kind of like how rock climbers will establish routes up rock faces so that when new climbers come into the environment, they can enjoy those routes without as much exploratory work. And if you could somehow record and document these experiences, what kind of experiential vectors could you get from that? And how could you apply those vectors to first-time users and second- and third-time users coming into the system over and over to make those experiences that much more compelling. This is visionary stuff. Um, we, we're not there yet, but again, where are we going? What do we really need for biometrics to work? I like to make the comparison that 
or a sophistication of Pong right now in the sense of volumetric narratives and smart systems like this. But just like the cinema and gaming industries in their early years, there is a lot of sophistication coming and it's coming quickly and we need to open our minds to possibilities of what's gonna happen. So in order to scale these and other volumetric experiences, Cable Apps has stood up the uh, Immersive Digital Experiences Alliance. This is a group of industry leaders who are working together to develop royalty-free solutions um, that's going to support everybody in the volumetric ecosystem. And we're now looking for studio partners to help make all this and more a reality. So I, people are all, always asking me, so why does cable care about this? Right? Um, and the short answer to that is that any volumetric solution requires a game engine to run that system. So long story short, Cable Labs is developing what is being called the 10G network. Uh, and this network is going to be able to handle the speeds and the low latency compute requirements um, to handle these kinds of experiences while delivering them to hundreds of millions of people simultaneously all over the world. So in short, the cable network is becoming a giant distributed game engine. All right, that's what I got. Um, any questions? If there's no questions, then we are moving at this time. <laughs>